the first uh, 10 years of my life, I enrolled in a primary school. Then it was quite exciting, the process of getting enlisted in school. Um, the eligibility is determined by wrapping your hand over your head and uh, for the tip of your finger to get to the lobe of your uh, right ear. Because um, I had, I think I just still have a large, relatively large head, it was quite difficult for me to get to school early. So I had a little delay um, starting uh, primary school. Uh, when eventually I started, things went well within that period. It is not really by accident. Um, my getting involved in poverty alleviation generally and microfinance specifically uh, was as a result of some factors in, in my life. The first the fact was that by the time I was stepping out of university in 1981, I had sufficiently um, get the understanding uh, due to my ideological orientation that to be able to uh, determine whether a society or indeed a nation has developed, you need to consider the condition of people at the bottom end of the society. And therefore, it was quite easy for me to determine that I would want to operate at that level. Uh, in terms of environmental factor, if you remember in the early 1980s, uh, that's exactly when the economic challenges that we have today actually began with the uh, glut in the international oil market resulting in reduced revenue and challenges in government being able to meet its obligations. And that led eventually five years later, precisely in 1986, uh, the adoption of the Structural Adjustment Program, the SAP, which in effect uh, affected or actually enhanced the uh, incidence of poverty. It was a more, LAPO therefore was a more of a non-governmental response to the increase in the level of poverty, both in severity and spread at that time. I do not just only believe and agree with them, I also try as much as possible to try to put it into expression. Um, I strongly believe that the first and the most important asset you have as an organization, whether a business, whether a church, whatever it is, are the people. For me, uh, it may be against convention. I will put my staff before my customer because it is the staff, the staff actually recruit, retain, and serve uh, customers. For, for me, um, people are very important, and therefore, every CEO that wants to add value and outperform his uh, peers must engage in proper organization, organizing his people, empowering his people, and also uh, ensuring that uh, demand for accountability from the people. Uh, what is likely going to evolve in the next uh, 10 years, especially in Africa, is actually going to be a continuation of the challenges we already have at hand in our head. About 10 years ago, I was a part of a panel uh, where we try to look at what would be the greatest challenge that Africa will have. Uh, it was more about the population, especially the increasing uh, population of youth in, on the continent. 
and um, we I try to also look at both sides of it. With this increase in population, it will really generate a risk or will be opportunity for uh, for businesses and even for all other people. Uh, for me, it will be opportunity. I will want to look at that direction of opportunity only and only if the people, especially the youth, are sufficiently empowered in terms of education. Uh, that given, where do I see opportunity as an entrepreneur going forward? I see um, the following areas presenting huge opportunity for any enterprising person. The first would be in agriculture. Uh, I believe that um, the, the conventional uh, process of small scaleholders, individuals, you know, farmers producing for his so household consumption and the little for the market will go away. And therefore that will generate huge needs, taking into account that the population growth. And therefore, people who have the right resources, the strategy and plan could really take on opportunity in large farming uh, on the continent. There's going to be a huge demand for food. The second one is the fact that increasingly, we are beginning to identify two things. The first is the fact that people are beginning to be aware of the need to seek uh, health uh, medical um, uh, services. Unfortunately, on the continent as well, we do also know the poor infrastructure, uh, the infrastructural deficit in that sector. And therefore, the health sector, both the direct medical care and diagnostic services present huge opportunity for individuals and for corporate entities that would look for where to add or what to create value on, on the continent. The third one is obvious, is that we're going to look at the whole area of power, electricity. Uh, there may be, there's going to be a, a movement from the conventional source of energy to the clean energy space, um, solar energy, and all that. I also see that as an opportunity. Therefore, for me and my colleagues, um, it's for us to look at those areas of agriculture, healthcare, and also um, uh, clean energy. Uh, good enough, we are already uh, having some uh, institutions playing those sectors, though at a minimal level at the moment. several moments of being in the valley and also some you know triumph uh, fans standing on, on, on heels. If you look at the moments in the valleys, um, I would say the, the toughest one at this was actually started at the beginning. Uh, when I put in place what LAPO should be and what we would do um, it was quite difficult for me to have the, get the acceptance um, in Oguashiko where I started. Um, funny enough, uh, for most women, uh, what we were doing or what we tended to do sounded too good to be true. That you're going to provide loans to people without asking for collateral. Um, and it was like, and we're also requesting people to organize into what we call credit uh, growth. So, but we needed to, you know, do a lot, I needed to do a lot of sensitization. Um, the, 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 the rejection, uh, which actually was ironic in the first place because we felt strongly that they needed money, but here people were thinking that uh, this thing will not work. Uh, even some of my early colleagues who said this damn thing will not work. So it was quite challenging. That way I was able to overcome that period was something uh, I, I was try to remember. And I also feel that that really prepared me 
for uh, subsequent challenges uh, later. The, 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 point, um, the point where I really had that feeling uh, was in 2005, early 2005. Um, before then, we know we were no profit entity. And what happened before was that all of us, those of us who were in the non-profit uh, space in the microfinance sector, were depending on grants. And it was given that if you are no profit, you're going to seek for grants. And um, three years earlier, I made up my mind that I was going to seek for commercial loan. And that was something unusual. People don't want to hear the microfinance sector. And the, the second challenge was the fact that if we're going to relate with commercial um, um, institutions, both local and international, especially international financial institutions, you're going to ensure that you have a system that is excellent because they will make more demand on you in terms of appraisal and due diligence. And we decided to go, go through that process of system strengthening. So by 2005, we got our first international loan. And that for me was like, yes, we've done it. Just like what has been done in, uh, in Asia and in Latin America. And the second thing, the second thing was the fact that it came out of that uh, accomplishment. That is to say, that was the beginning of LAPO uh, scaling up. You know, we had so much money and we had the system in place and we grew. We therefore moved from number nine in the microfinance NGO uh, that were the big one we had 10, we were number nine. So we moved from number nine to far number one within just a year. And so that was for us, everybody began to, uh, to say, yes, we got it right. Those things that really have been uh, anchored, those things that uh, keep you stable, in my understanding. I believe that first is my upbringing um, to actually believe strongly in the uh, love and the sovereignty and the ability of God. So put together faith. Um, I was brought up to really strongly believe that, look, whatever you want to do, you need to seek divine intervention. Uh, so in times of trial, uh, I, I would, it would be like my anchor. And the second one would also be my wife. Um, setting up LAPO is not like setting up a business. You know, I would say that LAPO crawl. Crawl, you know, it's not like you sit down today and say we have a business plan, we get the right people and say that no, that was not what happened. It, it crawled, and that process was quite demanding. And the fact that I was right at the beginning of the microfinance revolution globally, it demanded on my time, you know, travels. At a point in time, I was spending almost 17 days out of my home every month. And I would jokingly say that I was becoming a visiting father and a visiting husband. But in all this, my wife was able, you know, to provide that stability, that support. And it is for that reason, I'm, you know, very, very grateful uh, to her as one of those things that was my real anchor uh, in doing what we have been able to do. The third one is more collectivity. Uh, that would be uh, my people. 
But when I mean my people, I mean the, the, the staff. I have, for many years, I have remained the face of LAPO. But the real LAPO are those people, young Nigerians, boys and girls, traversing the rural communities, urban slums, to deliver the services that we do. Uh, they inspire me most of the time. Probably I would say that you worry uh, less, especially when you have to deal with people uh, who for one reason, you know, betray uh, you or you had a lot of trust on you know, and they betray you. Um, that, that could be for me uh, an advice that would, uh, um, would be very, very useful if you want to succeed in uh, business. If I were to advise my, um, my, my younger self, let me put it this way, I would see, say that you, he should still emphasize three key principles. And these principles are one, diligence, you know. Um, continuously to work, you know, hard, because there is really no other alternative. And this can be operationalized by uh, being punctual um, in, in what you do. For instance, I made it a duty to be able to every day to uh, be at my off uh, my on my desk at eight o'clock i try to do that every day so that's is something that i would you know still recommend for you know a younger self at that point the, the second one is integrity um because of the nature of my relationship both business relationship and individual uh, Integrity demonstration of integrity has helped us extremely uh, well. I strongly believe, and I always tell younger people, that what really happened to support you do not often happen in your presence. It's, like, it's almost what people say about you that convince other people to be of huge assistance. So I would really advise anyone like that to uh, stick to integrity and honesty. In our environment, to some extent, it could present some challenges. You could, you know, encounter some resistance. You could actually suffer some losses. But usually, those losses are short term. On the long run, it, integrity pace and we have benefited from that uh, as an organization. The third one is personal discipline. Um, to be able to really achieve much. Uh, talent is fantastic if you are talented, but I strongly believe that you need to ensure that um, there is some real, you know, uh, element of personal discipline. So put personal discipline plus integrity and diligence, I do not see any reason why a young person uh, will not become successful even within just 20 years. First of all, I, I want to say yes, in, the, in my more than 30 years uh, engagement in this sector, I have actually come across very smart people uh, who, uh, for whatever reason, um, may not have been able to uh, keep on the track uh, of success, so to speak. Uh, what are the factors? I think all those factors are very, very important, uh, except that you could in any way try to um, uh, assign, you know, uh, score weights to each of them. But the reality is that 
any man who has been able to consistently be on a path for 30 years in, in our environment uh, must have benefited from the fact that you have the right preparation for what you are doing uh, in, in terms of academic qualification or professional qualification. I, I jokingly tell people that it appears that all my training before and even during my engagement in microfinance was were all made to prepare me from, uh, for what I'm doing. I have a first degree in sociology, um, a second degree in development studies. I did not just have a diploma in cooperative uh, trips and a credit management, but I was in practice for about six years. Uh, finally, having a doctorate in financial inclusion. So that's you know that that, that prepared me. The second one is the whole issue of um, integrity. As I said, um, what makes you to have favor and support for people is not necessarily what you tell people. If I come before you and I say. My name is Godwin Eke Amosoy. I'm very good. I'm very this. The person I'm speaking to, whether a representative of an, a corporate entity, will believe me to some extent. But if, on the other hand, uh, you have someone else, based on my reputation, talk to the same person and said, I'm Joseph, but I strongly believe that Godwin is good, though it's not his good the person is likely going to believe. So integrity is extremely important. But mark you, uh, in our environment, you're going to have some pushback. You're going to actually suffer some losses. We did that in our, in our, in our we, uh, we, we suffer some losses because we, um, in relationship with certain entity, we insisted that this is the way we want to do our things right. But like I said, uh, we also have instances where because of that, we had huge uh, support. You can't take away the factor of divine intervention. Um, there are few things that will happen to you. Um, you cannot fully explain with all the logical uh, uh, reasoning, only to say that this, ha this could have happened because of um, what you call luck or uh, divine intervention. So you must show me a successful person and doing something for 30 years and successfully. I will surely show you, point at a person who has diligence, who was sufficiently prepared, who have demonstrated level of integrity and again has benefited for the value intervention. Ranking of the importance of money in my journey could uh, the rank could change over time, you know, at a particular point in time. Um, uh, when we started uh, with the little money I have and then we have grants, I realized that grant was going to be quite corrupting. It's not a loan, you're not going to pay back, you're going to, you know, you're giving to do whatever, it's going to be corrupting. And believe me, now, it's not because I'm just looking back and saying this. At that time, I decided to devalue money. When I mean devalue money, money should not make a, um, sense to me as an individual, but make so much sense to what we're doing, LAPO. It is for that reason that we were able to ensure that uh, whatever resources we're able to mobilize, we ensure that we diligently apply them and the should in outputs. But over time, when you get, you know, older and uh, a lot of other responsibility, it becomes very important. But on the whole, both, especially from the business uh, angle, 
money is extremely important. It is the blood that flows through the vein of any business. And therefore, um, if you want to be successful, you must make sure that you do a lot of blood or money transfusion into your business and also ensure that you diligently handle it in a manner that it continues to stay in the business and make the business grow.